frame. This lecture will consider elemental thinking in architectural design and it will focus on one element in particular, the frame. The basic concepts of elemental thinking were formed in the 19th century. One very influential theory was formulated by a German architect called Gottfried Semper, so I will begin with him. First, some background information about Semper. In his early career, Semper had a very good position in the German city of Dresden, where he built important public buildings and ran the architecture course at the university. In the mid-19th century, Germany was a collection of principalities and not, as were Great Britain and France, a nation-state. Semper and many other people of his social class did not like this political arrangement. In 1948, Semper was involved in protests against the perceived backwardness of German socio-political arrangements. The protests failed and Semper was arrested and exiled. After living in Paris for a while, he came to London, where he remained until 1855. In those days, Britain was the epicentre of a process called industrialisation, which was giving rise to new forms of architecture and urbanism. At the time Semper arrived, London must have been an exciting place to be, but also strange, alarming and sometimes even shocking. While exiled in London, Semper worked on a book he was writing called Style in the Technical and Tectonic Arts, or Practical Aesthetics. As he worked on his book, inevitably Semper's thinking was informed by his experiences of London. Semper needed to give his practical aesthetics some foundational ideas, but he wanted to avoid the classical principles that still haunted architectural theory in those days. Semper decided to base his practical aesthetics on four common methods of building, which he called the elements of architecture. They are tectonics, or carpentry, stereotomics, or masonry, textiles, or weaving, pottery, or ceramics. In Semper's theory, the elements come before architecture. They are born out of the day-to-day -day necessities of living in an agrarian society. In other words, a society based on farming. The elements are the basis of activities like making clothes, domestic furnishings, pens and fences for keeping animals, temporary structures for ritual events and dwellings for shelter. However, when the elements eventually are used to create architecture, then each one becomes a symbol of a specific building form. Tectonics symbolises the roof or frame. Stereotomics symbolises the platform, plinth or podium. Textiles symbolises the screen, curtain wall or barrier and pottery symbolises the hearth or fireplace. Furthermore, each symbol is poetically linked to a natural element. Tectonics to air, stereotomics to earth, textiles to water, pottery to fire. We'll look a little more carefully at all this in a moment. For now, I want to turn to a very important event that took place at the time Semper was in London. Today, it's hard to imagine the excitement of the first international exhibition for industry and art, which opened in Hyde Park on the 1st of May 1851. The exhibition was housed in a new kind of building made from metal and glass. It was called the Crystal Palace. At the time, people claimed the large metal and glass building gave them entirely new kinds of feelings and sensations. Here, is how one visitor to the Crystal Palace described it. We are in an artificially created environment that has already ceased to be a space. We are separated from nature, but yet we are scarcely conscious of it. The barrier that separates us from the landscape is barely perceptible. We find ourselves, so to speak, in a piece of sculpted atmosphere. 
The sun's rays come to us not through individual openings. They fill the space with a completely beautiful naturalness. And as the sun of this space does not give or allow the light to be anything special or particular, so we must also be content with the fact that the colours borrow their limits from the objects outside. In this way, it is like a magical, poetic form of light. For us, living in the early 21st century, enormous metal and glass buildings are nothing out of the ordinary. In fact, we have rather come to disapprove of them. We tend to associate them with the climate crisis and all its associated problems. But for a person who was experiencing a large metal and glass building for the first time, it was remarkable. And I think the notion of being in a piece of sculpted atmosphere is a good metaphor for what it might actually have felt like to stand in the Crystal Palace. Semper was involved in the design of a number of the exhibitions inside the palace. He even designed a theatre, shown in this drawing, which unfortunately was never built. Notice how Semper drew the actual metal and glass building as a framework of lines fading into the sky. But Semper wasn't very interested in metal and glass and sculpted atmosphere. What fascinated him were the exhibits inside the Crystal Palace. It is said he visited them every day, familiarising himself with the various items placed on display. One item Semper found especially interesting was a one-to-one -one model of a Caribbean hut from Trinidad, which to him seemed to embody the four elements in a remarkable way. Because the idea of the four elements had come to Semper before he saw the Caribbean hut, when he did see it, he immediately read it as proof that his theory was correct. Semper's practical aesthetics includes a drawing and a written description of the Caribbean hut, and I am now going to use them to demonstrate the four elements to you. To begin with, tectonics. In Semper's system, any framework of posts, beams and rafters is a tectonic element. The framework of the hut was made from bamboo. I have coloured it dark blue in this drawing. In Semper's system, the tectonic element is described as a process of joining stick-shaped elastic components resistant to forces working along the length. The tectonic process will produce three-dimensional lattice structures that are open and relatively lightweight, which is why tectonics is linked to the natural element air. To help you visualise what I mean, here is a picture of a mid-20th century building by the famous architect Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. It is a twin department block in Chicago called Lakeshore Drive. In this picture, the buildings are still under construction, and as you can see, each one is a lattice structure relatively lightweight and open to the air. This is a picture of the buildings in their completed condition. You can't see the lattice now, but you can still see how it influences the appearance of the building. Now let's look at the stereotomic element. In Semper's system, any platform, plinth or podium is a stereotomic element. You can just make out in the drawing that the hut sits on a raised platform. I have coloured it green. And if you look closely, you can even see the markings of a course of brickwork or maybe stone. Masonry involves working with strong, densely aggregated materials that resist crushing and compression. The most common material used in masonry is stone. The mason will work the material into regular, systematic pieces that can be piled up on top of one another. I am using this archaeological drawing of an old Roman tomb to help you to visualise what I mean by masonry. Notice the way the structure is embedded in the ground and how the courses of stone or brickwork run as even bands horizontally from the top to the bottom of the structure. This is a house by the contemporary Spanish architects called her Architects. The house is conceived as a single masonry element, like a plinth or podium, with spaces hollowed out on the inside. In this view, we are looking toward the plinth 
house from the street outside. This is the plan. Here you can see how the house seems to turn its back on the street outside to look inwards towards the garden. Also notice the way thick masonry walls divide up the spaces of the interior so that these spaces feel like they have been made by subtracting from the solid figure of the plinth. Next we come to the textile elements. In simpler system, any screen, barrier or curtain wall is a textile element. On the drawing of the hut, you can see two kinds of textile element fill in between the members of the frame. I have coloured them pale blue. On the roof, you see the textile element looks like it is made from tiles, while on the walls it is a wickerwork of some kind, perhaps made of rope or long grass. Textile elements keep out the rain and the sun, but perhaps more importantly, they separate the building into an inside and an outside, and they subdivide the interior into spaces with different functions and atmospheres. This image shows a view of a play factory by the architects Sel Gascano, who are especially good at working with screens. I show it to you because the screen element is translucent and so you can just make out the ghost of the supporting framework behind. Here is another example by the same architects. Notice how inventive they are with their choice of shapes and materials so that each screen seems to have its own unique character. Finally we come to the pottery element. In Semper's system, any hearth or fireplace is a pottery element. On this drawing, I have coloured the hearth orange. It is represented by a round figure on the plan diagram and a raised bump on the elevation. For Semper, the hearth was especially important because it served as a place for formalising social relationships. He wrote about it as the locus of exchange and communication. He wrote... Around the hearth, the first groups assembled. Around it, the first alliances formed. Around it, the first religious concepts were put into the customs of the cult. Throughout all phases of society, the hearth formed that sacred focus around which the whole took order and shape. There are many examples of architects who have picked up on the idea of the hearth as the heart of the building. This is especially so in the design of houses. This image shows the fireplace in the Manson house by Frank Lloyd Wright. Notice how the space of the house seems to revolve around the hearth. Here is the Farnsworth house by Mies van der Rohe. The large yellow structure is the hearth of the house, or the core as Mies sometimes called it. It includes a fireplace, but it also includes other services such as a kitchen, bathrooms, utility room. Notice how the main living space of the house revolves around the core. Here is another example from Frank Lloyd Wright. It is called the Johnson House. Here the fireplace sits at the centre of a double height living space. It is embedded in a hollow brickwork column that acts as a chimney and as a vertical circulation coil. In this house by OMA Rem Coolhouse, the hearth has been entirely taken over by the circulation function. This house was designed for a man confined to a wheelchair. Here the focus of the house is a moving platform that rises vertically through all three levels of the house. Notice the shelf behind stacked with books and other artefacts the man might like to use. Now that I have introduced the four elements, I'm going to concentrate on showing you some buildings that place a special emphasis on the frame. This does not mean the other elements are not present in the examples I'm showing you, it just means they're not so obvious. I will stick to the theme of the house to begin with. This is the stone house by the architects Herzog and de Muron, perhaps better known to you as the architects of Tate Modern. Stone House is in a place called Tavole in the Italian Alps. It was designed and built between 1982 and 1988. The form and structure of the house is based on a concrete frame. You can see the frame in this oblique view. 
In this rear view of the house, you can see more clearly how the frame is able to break away from the main body of the house to form an outside pergola, which, as you can see, rests on a plinth amidst the surrounding meadow. The dry stone walling that fills in between the framework is made from a local stone rubble. In this side view, you can see how openings are set into the dry stonework to make windows and doors. Notice at the top, the dry stone walling stops and a strip of glass panels is set into the frame. Turning now to the plan and sections of the house, notice how the interior space is divided by a Latin cross-shaped figure to make four rooms, with two smaller rooms at the back and two larger ones at the front. The cross stops short of the perimeter walls and the doors between the rooms are pushed to the gap between the cross and the perimeter walling. The frame is represented in these drawings too. It is easiest to identify on the plan, but you can recognise it on the long section because the section cuts through the pergola where the frame is freestanding. It is more difficult to spot on the short section. Notice first that the cross-shaped figure of the internal walls is drawn in the same way as the members of the frame. And notice secondly the way the cross aligns with the frame. That probably tells us the internal walls are made from concrete. The external walls on the other hand are drawn as a double skin with dry stone rubble on the outside and a layer of concrete blocks on the inside. Here is a drawing showing several details of the construction. Notice at the corner, detail 3.2, the frame is set behind the dry stone rubble, whereas further along, detail 3.1, it is made to bridge from the outside to the inside, passing through the zone of the dry stone rubble on the outside and into the zone of insulation and block work on the inside. The drawing also shows how a window can be set within the layered construction of the wall. Here is a close-up view that shows what it looks like to see each of those details. You can see the corner condition, you can see the bridging condition and you can see a window. Notice the slim metal frame that abuts the dry stone rubble. It takes up the irregularities of the rubble to make a clean opening into which the window is set. I now want to look at a more recent frame building. It is designed by architects, whom I have already mentioned in this talk. The building is a research centre for the Autonomia University of Barcelona. It opened in 2014. As you can see from this image, the frame does not appear in the external look of the building. What we see in this image is the elaborate screening system that wraps around the outer perimeter of the building, including the rooftop. The envelope of the building that we see in all these external views was designed to function as a low-cost bioclimatic skin. The skin of the building is like a greenhouse. On the outermost face you see a system of transparent polycarbonate panels that are hinged and can be opened and closed mechanically. The opening and closing mechanism is run from a computer which can interpret measurements from inside and outside the building and adjust the panels accordingly. Behind the panels is a clear zone where air can circulate freely from the ground and up into the roof space. The external screen proper to each room inside the building is on the inner face of the clear zone. As you can see in this ventilation diagram, in the hot summer months the panels are opened and cooler air circulates from the bottom to the top of the building. In the cold winter months, on the other hand, the panels are closed and warm air, harnessed through solar gain, can circulate through the building. But the ventilation strategy needs more than a bioclimatic skin to work properly. It needs the building to be very open on the inside, and that is where the frame comes in. Here is a view inside the building. You can see the bioclimatic skin running across the top in the roof space. This is a view of just one of the four light wells that rise up through the full height of the building. 
Notice how open and light it is. You can now see the frame and of course it is not at all surprising to see a frame defining this kind of space because a frame is an open lattice that defines space without fully enclosing it. Notice how the screens that separate out individual rooms are set back from the frame. They read as discrete boxes in space, each with its own doors and windows. You can see the separation of frame and rooms on this first floor plan. Notice the way the light dwells have been drawn onto the plan and the way they relate to the frame and to the layout of rooms. Because the rooms are discrete elements, so the spaces in between can be designed with their own character. Here we see an in-between space used to display a chalkboard. The rooms come in various sizes. This one is designed as an office for two or three people. This one is a workshop or laboratory. Notice on the right the room looks into one of the light wells and on the left it looks into the zone of the bioclimatic envelope. This drawing shows a section through the building and it shows there are two levels of basement. The reason is partly because the site has a change in level, which you can't see on the section. But there are sound environmental reasons for having basements, because being below ground means basements are very well insulated from the climate above and outside. This means there is less seasonal variation of temperature, leaving the basement cooler in summer and warmer in winter. Here is a view of the roof space. You can see how the bioclimatic skin is designed to wrap over the top of the building. Notice the frame does not extend up into the roof. All we see here is the support system propping up the external panels. And notice it is here, up in the roof, that the bioclimatic skin seems most like a greenhouse. I want to end this presentation by looking at this building designed by MOS Architects. As you can see, the building is still under construction. MOS Architects are based in New York, but the building is located in Nepal, some 10 kilometers outside of Kathmandu, the capital city. It is called the Lali Gurren's Orphanage Library and Seismic Shelter and was commissioned by a charity called Seeds for Change. As you can see from this picture, Lali Gurren's is still under construction. This is an axonometric drawing of Lali Gurren's. You can see the building is a single block set within a walled garden with a gateway set into the garden wall. Notice how the look of the single block is dominated by the three-dimensional frame that tapers from the bottom to the top. The vertical members of the frame are quite closely spaced and that, together with the tapering shape, gives it the extra stability it needs to withstand the kinds of forces that often occur in this region due to earthquakes. If you look at this cutaway axonometric, you can see it is only the outermost layer of the frame that tapers upwards. You can also see there is an ambulatory zone that wraps around the building on all four sides. The ambulatory is an interstitial space. It is neither fully inside nor fully outside. It contains walkways and stairways and allows people to move around and up and through the building from bottom to top without going properly inside. Here is a view of a model that shows how stairways climb up within the ambulatory zone. In this constructed view showing children playing in the garden, you can see how easy it is to move from the garden into the ambulatory zone. If we turn to study the floor plans, we can see how the zone of the ambulatory appears to wrap around as if to guard a more sheltered volume of space inside. We can also see how the zone of the ambulatory is separated from the interior volume by a screen that runs around the inner face of the ambulatory. The screen is made of panels that fit in between the members of the frame and we can see how some of these panels swing open acting as doors. Notice on the first floor plan, that is the plan at ground level, 
There is the direct entrance up the stairs into the ambulatory, but also notice how the screen pushes out across the zone of the ambulatory, providing an entrance lobby into the interior volume. If you were to pass through the lobby, you would enter the library, shown in this constructed view. Notice it is a double height space. You can see how the bookshelves are designed so as to correspond to the rhythm of the building frame and notice the ambulatory zone, just beyond the screen of shelving. Notice also there are no books on the shelves. If there were, then they would occlude the view into the ambulatory. Now that you know the library is a double height space, we can return to the plans and you can understand why there is a mezzanine level plan above the first floor plan. Turning to the second floor plan, you can see a large open space corresponding to the library below. On this level, the large space functions as the dining room and meeting hall. It too is a double height. Here is a constructed view showing what the dining meeting hall would be like. There are no perimeter shelves in this space, so the relationship to the ambulatory is more direct. Note the children running out through the openings in the framework onto the stairways and walkways of the ambulatory. Returning again to the plans, two more floors up at third floor level are the dormitories for the orphans. Notice at this level there is no large single open space. Instead we see two stoa type spaces labelled 22 on the plan. These are the dormitories. Each one is divided into five small rooms, each with a cupboard and beds for two orphans. You can see that the third floor also has a mezzanine which tells us the dormitory stoas are double height spaces. You can see how the spatial arrangements we have looked at in the plans and in the constructed views correspond to the way the building is drawn in section and elevation. Notice how emphatically the setting out grid appears in the section. Here you can see how parts of the double height dormitory stoves are roofed over with a terrace garden. The planting will protect the bedrooms underneath from heat gain on intense sunny days, keeping them cool and in the winter insulate them from the cold air outside. Here is a constructed view of one of those roof gardens. You can see from this view that the frame is not entirely open at this level. It is partly enclosed so as to provide classroom spaces for the children. Notice also by the time we have reached this level the ambulatory has narrowed down considerably due to the tapering of the frame. To end with, I return to the cutaway axonometric. As well as corresponding to the forces of gravity, I would suggest the tapering of the frame symbolises the idea that, although at the bottom the institution is open to the wider community, by the time it reaches the top, it has narrowed to accommodate just the select few, in this case, the community of orphans and their carers.